Okay, so let's get started. Um, hello and welcome to our fourth workshop of the quarter. And today we'll be covering dynamic programming. So um, first, uh, we'll review some recursion and get down to dynamic programming. But then we'll uh, uh, introduce some induction concepts and how that relates to dynamic programming. And finally, we'll work on some practice problems together and do mock interviews. So let's get started. Uh, to start with, um, please take a look at this recursive algorithm. Um, can you tell me uh, what it is doing? Yes, correct. So assuming a non-negative input, uh, this function is calculating n Fibonacci now. For those uh, who don't know, uh, Fibonacci numbers form a sequence which starts from zero and one, and every subsequent element is uh, equals equals to the sum of its two preceding elements. Uh, with that in mind, uh, do you know what the time complexity of this function is? Yes. Uh, so, since every call of this function evokes two other calls. We can say that the time complexity is around two to the power of n. Well, not really. The exact time complexity is golden ratio to the power of n. And if you're curious, you can find explanation for that uh, here uh, in the link. Uh, well, no matter what the exact number is, uh, this algorithm is way too slow. So let's actually see what exactly it's doing to understand how can we optimize it? Let's uh, uh, work on a small example. Imagine uh, the input, we are trying to compute Fibonacci number five. So we start here, we call our function with input five. Then uh, the function evokes two other calls with input four and input three. We first go to the first function call with input n equals four which in turn evokes two other function calls with n equals three and n equals two. This way we get all the way down here when we call f equals, uh, when we call function for n equals one and n equals zero. And then we backtrack all the way to f3 and calculate f1 again. Then we backtrack to f4 and calculate f2, f1 and f0 again. And finally, we go back to our initial function call and repeat all the calculations for f3, f2, f1, f0, and f1 again. Well, there's a lot of repetition going on. Well, in fact, all the branches of this uh, function call tree that are in red are redundant. Indeed, we've calculated all our values, f, um, f1, f0, f2, f3, f4, and f5, just in this blue branch. So the question now is, how are we able to remove these red computations? So this is where the dynamic programming takes over. Uh, we can use technique called memoization, uh, which is uh, uh, one of the dynamic programming approaches. Essentially, in a nutshell, uh, we are trying to record values that we comp already compute so that next time we want to find out the value, we can simply look into the array or any other data structure and check what the value is instead of repeating the same algorithm over and over again. Let's see how this works in practice. So we go uh, all the way down to this function call f1. Uh, we compute and we know that it's it equals to one. Then uh, we compute f0, which equals to zero. Uh, later on, we go back to F2, we compute F2, it's again one, F3 is two. And finally, here is where we can really save some computations. Instead of performing a uh, function call for F2, F1 and F0 again, we can simply retrieve our value F2 from the array with all of one time complexity. Again, as we go back to call for F5, instead of repeating all these calculations, we can simply retrieve our value for F3 from the array with all one time complexity. 
This drastically improves uh, the overall time complexity of the problem. So this actually, uh, I pasted a snippet of C++ code here. And uh, please take a, look at, uh, take a look at it. And let me know if you have any questions. Well, notice that, uh, notice this line here uh, where we, uh, uh, so I have, I have to mention that uh, before storing the values, we actually initialize our elements to uh, minus one, for example, because we know that no Fibonacci number will be equal to mi minus one. And this way we are able to check if we already computed our value or if we still need to perform other function calls to compute it. So uh, the optimization actually happens here where if we already computed our number, so it's not minus one, and if it's larger than one, then we simply retrieve value from the array with all one time complexity. All right. So uh, what we just covered is one of the approaches that, that dynamic programming takes. Dynamic programming is an optimization technique uh, that utilizes recursion by remembering the results of subproblems. Uh, the approach we took in Fibonacci example is called memoization or top-down dynamic programming. Since we started at the very top with the first function call and went all the way down to uh, F1 and F0. I have to mention that dynamic programming is only useful when you have a lot of overlapping subproblems. That way, by performing that uh, computation for one subproblem, you don't need to repeat that computation over and over again, since you can store that result. So this is essentially what dynamic programming means. Um, well, this is just the code that I already showed you. Um, although we almost, uh, although we reached uh, almost reached the time the best time complexity here, the algorithm works with off and time complexity. There are still some performance issues with this code. Uh, can you tell me any uh, issues you can spot? Sorry? Like you're storing, you're storing numbers that you want to like do this. Like if you're doing the fourth one that you still- Oh, correct. Still yeah, that's one of the problems. So uh, basically on the uh, stack, uh, we store the values. So basically here, we send our array, which holds all the values. So uh, we kind of wasting memory, that's one. And the second problem is that uh, we are actually uh, performing a lot of function calls. And as you might know, the function calls are heavy. Uh, they take a lot of time. So uh, we want to perform as few function calls as possible. So, and the memory problem, we'll address it a little later. So as for the function calls, uh, there is actually a, another dynamic programming technique which uh, allows us to reduce the number of function calls. It's called bottom-up dynamic programming or tabulation. Here, we can notice that if we instead start from the very bottom of the tree and say we know F0, we know F1, then uh, we actually know how the every subsequent element depends on previous elements. So we know F2 is sum of F1 F and F0. So we can say it's one. We know F3 is sum of F1 and F2, it's two, and so on all the way until we reach F5. So now we started from F0 and reached all the way to the end to our uh, value that we're trying to compute. This uh, approach is useful when you uh, know exactly how the subsequent value depends on previous values. Um, to show how it works, here I pasted a snippet uh, with code for this function. So you see here how we first initialize the first base values for F1 and F0. And then we simply loop uh, through every element from zero from two to n, 
and sum, sum up two previous elements to find the value. This way, there is just one function call, and this saves us a lot of runtime. Uh, do you have any questions about this? Nice. So, um, well, as you mentioned before, there is still some waste of memory going on. Uh, partic in particular, we can ask ourselves a question. How many previous values does a value depend on? Well, it's just two. If I know F3 and F4, I can calculate F5. I don't need to know F2, F1, F0. That's all in the past. As, so as, long as soon as I know those two preceding values, I can uh, unambiguously identify the next value. This way, we can actually reduce our code to these few lines without using an auxiliary array. We can simply say that we have two variables, A and B, and we just update them every time we calculate a subsequent value. Thus, we obtain all of one space complexity. Do you have any questions about this code? OK, good. So um, in this case, I'll hand it over uh, to Neil to talk about induction. Hey, so the reason, oh, the slide link. Um, Katie, can you get on that? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so one of the hardest, sorry? OK, yeah. She'll, she'll you the link. Yeah. So one of the hardest things when um, solving a DP problem is usually not the actual coding of the DP, as you saw it, like translating a recursive algorithm into a dynamic problem style is pretty simple because all you're doing is remembering the results of subproblems. But the question is, how do we get to those subproblems in the first place? So I'm just going to show a little bit of an alternate way of thinking about DP problems that hopefully this will help in um, actually going at a DP problem figuring out a way to solve it and then implementing DP. So first of all, are you guys familiar with induction? Sort of, okay, yeah, we can go through the full um, example. So I think the most classical example of um, how to explain induction is the example of climbing a ladder. So basically what this means is suppose you have a ladder, it's gonna be a horizontal ladder, but you want to get to some point on the ladder, right? But we want to prove that by starting at the beginning, we can climb up the ladder to as many places as we want. And eventually, we can reach anywhere on the ladder. Right. So there's some parts of the induction proof. Right. There's the base case, the inductive hypothesis, and the inductive step. And essentially, the combination of these are going to allow you to prove that anywhere on the ladder, if we start at the beginning, we can get anywhere. Right. So how does this work? First of all, what is the one thing we know what we can do on a ladder? So when you're climbing a ladder, what do you do? You go from one rung to the next rung, right? That's all we do on a ladder. We can't like skip stuff. We can't go around. So we have this operation, just one step, right? And as you can see, this step is actually sufficient to go anywhere, right? Because when you're climbing a ladder, you just keep taking steps over and over and over to get to wherever you want to go. So to start off, we need to get on the ladder to show that we can get anywhere on the ladder, right? And that's what we would call the base case. The base case would be, we know we can hit this first point, right? Imagine if you knew you could climb through the rungs on the ladder, but you didn't know that you could actually find the ladder in the first place, right? Then you wouldn't be able to say, oh, anywhere on the ladder, I'll be able to get to if we just couldn't find a ladder in the first place, right? So we need a starting point to start the climb, right? Now, the next point is we know that we can always make one step, right? But we need to know to show that we can go anywhere, we can actually make a step up till some point, right? So if we want to get to this position, which I'll call K, right? What we can do is we can assume that up to the last position, k minus 1. If we can get to k minus 1, we know we can get to k, right? Because we know we have that one step that we can do, right? 
So we have to have an inductive hypothesis here, which states we know we can get to k minus one. Right? Once we know that, we can take the inductive step and say that we can climb up one rung of the ladder to get to point k. Right? Now, the reason that this works for any point at all is if we start at the bottom, you can clearly see that, OK, to get to this first position, I'll draw this in blue. The first position over here, we know we can get onto the ladder, and we know we can climb one step. So that means we can get to this first position, right? Now, to get to the second position, remember, we want the hypothesis that we can get to 1. But using that step from 0, we've shown that we can get to 1. So that means we must be able to get to 2. And now you can see that if we just keep applying that step, we can go step by step by step to any place we want to go. Right? Does that sketch make sense? How um, we would get here? Because this is a really powerful technique. A lot of proofs in, are made really easy by just doing induction, because you can say, oh, I know that this, whatever I'm trying to prove, holds for the first case. I know that if I assume it holds for some other case, I can go to the next place, and therefore it must hold for everything. Okay. So there's one more type of induction. So previously, we assumed that we could get to the k minus one step, right? But sometimes that's not sufficient. Sometimes we actually want to know that if we have a ladder like this, then not only can I get to this specific position, but then I know I can get to everywhere before it. So that's a change in the inductive hypothesis. So essentially what you're doing here is you're saying, oh, if I know that I can get to anywhere on the ladder before that, I can get to gay. So can you think of an example where this would be more useful than just knowing we can get to the step before? Like just when thinking about ladders? Is there any like anything that comes to mind? So what if instead of being able to make a single step, we could only make double steps? Right? So it would be something like this, right? Then we would need to change our hypothesis. So instead of knowing k minus 1, we need to know k minus 2, right? And we'd also need to change the base case so that we can get to 0 and 1. So essentially, what that means is we need more information than just the last one to show that we can get to whatever place that we want, right? So this is essentially making it a stronger case in the hypothesis. So. We can go ahead and do a little example here. So I think this is another classical problem, but basically it's saying show that every natural number n, which is all of the integers, like one, two, three, dot, 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 up to infinity, can be written in the form n equals to the power of k times l, where k is a non-negative integer and then l is an odd number. All right. So now using the frame of reference that we want to use induction on it, how would you go about starting this? Right. Do you remember what the three steps are in an inductive proof? Exactly. So base case first. What would be the base case here, right? We're trying to show that any natural number n can be written in that form. So where would be a nice logical place to start? Yep, exactly. So we want to start at 1. Because then we can just show that as we step up from one, we can hit every single natural number, right? So we have to actually prove this for n equals one, right? So can you think of a way that we could represent one as this formula over here, 2k to the k times L? Exactly. So the case here would be one is equal to two to the zero times one, right? And this is perfectly valid, like you said, because we have one is an odd integer, right? So the next step is, how are we going to use this fact to sort of step to all of the other natural numbers? Okay. So what we can think about is, we need to make, what's the next step? Exactly, perfect. Inductive hypothesis. So this is a statement 
that we assume we can in fact write some number right as the 2k of the l and use that to prove that the next number can be written as that right so what would you want this hypothesis to be here yeah that's very close so what would you what you would want to do in this hypothesis is you would want to assume that any natural number between zero or between one and some number we can call it i right because the whole point is we want to prove that this arbitrary number i we can use it to say oh i plus one can be represented this way so something that you would want to do in this hypothesis would be um for all numbers let's say oops one to i right we can write them as some two to the k times l right now is this regular induction or is this strong induction Exactly, it's strong induction because we assume that anything from one to i holds for the um, the proof that we're trying to prove here. So it would be normal induction if we just had it be just i, right? And the reason we want this is going to be apparent when we try to make an inductive step next, right? Because that is the last case. All right, so now in the inductive step, right, what are we trying to prove for? What number are we trying to prove this for? If we assume that it holds from one to i, what do we have to do in inductive step? i plus one, yep. So we have some number i plus one, right? Now we need to think how are we going to use the fact that the previous numbers can be represented in this way to show that i plus one can be represented this way. Right. So now, since this is a little bit tricky with no experience, I can break it down into two cases. That makes it a lot easier. Right. We know over here that we want k to be a non negative integer, and l is an odd number. Right. And as seen in one, if we have an odd number like one, we can just do two to the zero times itself. Right. So there is a case here. Case i plus one is odd. Right. How would we write this over here? It'd be i plus one is equal to two to the zero times i plus one. And this holds because i plus one is odd, right? Now the harder case is when this is actually even. All right, can you think about what we would do here? Yeah, that's very close to what we do, right? So the whole idea of breaking it down into some power of two, that's completely correct, right? And now we can take it, we can go a little bit easier than that, right? We have the assumption over here that anything between one and i, we can already write into the k times l, right? So some odd number, some power of k, right? When we know that i plus one is even, what guarantee are we given? Exactly, perfect. So what this tells us is since it's even, then we know that there exists some, we can just call it M, such that um, M is equal to I plus one over two, right? And we also know by just the property of division that M is between one and I, right? And now what this tells us is we can actually apply this inductive hypothesis here. Right? This is a very common step when you're doing inductive proof. You have to find some way to use the inductive hypothesis to prove that step. Right? Now that we know this, we know, I'm going to change colors here, that m is equal to some 2k prime times l prime. Right? And this is just used to just differentiate the numbers from something. So there's some k and some l such that m exists in that form. right? But what do we also know? We know that m is equal to i plus 1 over 2. So what this allows us to do is we can now directly just write 
I plus one is equal to two K prime plus one times L prime, right? Using the inductive hypothesis, we found some form that gave us that odd number that you were talking about. And then we found the power of two that associates with it. So that would be how to sort of take this formulate into an induction and then prove the claim that we're making here. Does everything about this make sense? All right, cool. So the next step is, what does this have to do with DP, right? This seems like it's just tangent into some random math stuff. So what you'll see here is taking this classic problem, coin change, we can break it down into some smaller problems, right? In what is the base case? What is the inductive hypothesis? What's the inductive step? And that'll allow us to sort of construct this um, recursive relation that allows us to solve this problem. And then all we have to do is apply the DP optimization on top of that. Okay, so let's break it down. Have you guys seen this problem already? Okay, I'm seeing some nods. No? You might have? Okay, it's fine then. So we can go then, we can just keep going through this and it'll just show it to you with, through like a different lens, right? So then, what is this problem? We're given an array of coins. So we're given some set that gives us some arbitrary amount of coins. They're all different values. And we have to figure out what is the smallest amount of coins that we can take from that set to make whatever value we want to make, right? Okay, seems pretty simple. And what we can do is break it down into those three parts here, right? So a base case. First of all, what is this problem asking us to do in terms of a base case, right? What would a base case be here? Or sorry, to rephrase this, what would we be do inducting over, right? Before we inducted over the natural numbers because it said for every natural number show that blah, right? Over here, we're not giving something as explicit as that. So we have to figure out first of all, what direction are we gonna perform the induction over, right? Would we do it over the coins? Would we do it over the value that we're trying to make? Which one would it be? Yeah, exactly. It would be the value because the coins don't change, right? We want to make sure that any value, we always get the best way to do it, right? Or in this case, I'll just start calling it the optimal solution. Okay. So let's start off with the base case. Now that we know what we're doing the induction over, the next step is the base case, right? And base case is generally the smallest way, right? Because the whole way we want to do recursion or induction is that we want the problem to keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until we hit the smallest size, right? If you have a recursion or if you have an induction where stuff is growing bigger, we never terminate and that's bad. So we want to figure out, okay, what's the direction? What would the base case be then? Yeah, that's exactly it. We want the, um, let's call it not equals zero, okay? And this makes sense intuitively because we have some non-zero value that we're trying to make. And when we try to split it down to sub problems, we wanna get it closer and closer and closer to zero. So that eventually we can say, oh yeah, I know that zero requires zero points to make and then build it up from there, right? So zero would require zero points. Okay, so that's the first step solved. Now the second thing, we need to find an inductive hypothesis. Okay. So over here, we already know that we're inducting over like the values, right? So we want to make the assumption that some smaller value holds and use that to prove that the next bigger value holds. Okay. So here, do you think we'd be using strong induction or would we just be using induction? And if the answer is not clear, don't worry, it'll get more clear as we go into the inductive step. So here, we can just, I can just go ahead and give you the answer that's strong induction and you'll see why in the next step. And then after we go through um, all of the process, I'll give you a little like small spiel about what exactly is the implication between solving something with strong induction and regular induction, right? So the hypothesis here would be, we need to assume something. So let's just say 
between zero and some value, we'll call it I, we know the optimal amount of coins needed to make each one of those values. Okay, so for all I, for all J, I, we have this, right? We have some sort of way to optimally decide how many coins we need. Okay, so the next step is the inductive step. And again, we have to find this for I plus one. And right? we make an assumption and we have to prove that using that assumption, we can get to the next place. And that means we have the optimal answer for everywhere. Okay. So how would we use a smaller value to get to a bigger value. Do you have any ideas of how this sort of transition would be made? Yep, that's exactly correct. That's that's what we'd want to do. So to put this into uh, more formal words, we know that when we take a coin, what we're doing is we're adding one coin to the coin total that it takes to make the optimal value, but also we're adding that coin's value or like amount in money to the overall value that we have. So exactly as you said, we can use that to work backwards because we can see for I plus one, for all C in coins, so these are all the coin values in coins, we can sort of collect into an array or into any data structure you want, right? All of the optimal I minus C, right? So we're taking the values going backwards and figuring out, oh, what's how many coins do we need to get to this place? How many coins do we need to get to this place? Over and over and over again, until we've covered all of the coins. Now what we do with this, there's one more step here. We need to figure out which one's the best way, right? We're trying to find the optimal way for every single time. So we actually have to take the minimum of this, right? Because the best way is the one with the least coins. And then one more step is, since we take the previous values and we add one coin to it, we actually have to add one to the amount of coins that we're using to build up the i plus one value, right? And now that we know how we make this step, we've shown that the way that we're constructing this is gives us the best value or the best way to make this value out of all of the coins, right? Does this explanation make sense of how we sort of got here through like the inductive ones? Okay, now the next step is, how do we actually put this into code, right? So this looks like very abstract, some math stuff. We need to make this concrete into code now. So first steps first is, remember the discussion that we had about top-down DP and bottom-up DP? So what would, um, what would lend itself to being used here? Remember in the induction, we have a base case and we've shown that using that step we can just keep stepping throughout all of the cases to get the best value at all of the points, right? So does that sound like a top-down DP or does it sound like a bottom-up DP? Bottom-up, perfect, right? We're actually solving the smallest value subproblems and then iterating upwards from it, right? So this would be, this will lend itself to an iterative solution, not a recursive solution. Right, so naturally, we're going to have some sort of for loop, right? This is going to be in a little bit of um, a pseudocode sense here. But the base case, right, we'd have to populate the memory that we need to store, right, for DP, because this naturally, if we keep solving all the subproblems by itself, then that's really slow. It's going back into the exponential like tree branch time. So what we do is you can just call this array DP. It's just a nice name, and it's very conventionally used in a lot of the solutions. We have to reserve space in it, right? How many, how many space do we have to reserve? We have to reserve space for all of the amounts, right? Because we're going to use each subproblem to eventually get to amounts, and then we can just return the last value of that array. 
right? Moving on to this, we have the base case, right? The base case is saying, we already know the answer to the first sub problem, so we're just gonna put it in here and build up everything from there, right? We know it's equal to zero. Now we have some loop. So we're going for i going from one to the amount, right? We need to do something here. And what is that something? We have to perform that inductive step over and over again, right? The inductive hypothesis is sort of encapsulated all in this DP array. Because any value in the DP array is saying we already have the best value for that position, right? So we already have the inductive hypothesis encoded into that array or the memory array, the DP array. So all that's left is doing the inductive step here. So again, this is just some pseudocode, but for all of the coin values, you just take the minimum of i minus c plus one, and then update the remember array with the optimal solution there with this answer. So let's just call that O, o or something. Right. Does that solution make sense? So that's essentially all you have to do. And then just return DP amount. So I would encourage you to go and actually code this in the code, because again, there is some like complexity in taking pseudocode, taking an idea and putting it into real code, because there's a lot of stuff you have to do here with like boundary checks, making sure all of everything in the array is legal. What do I initialize the array with? And it's all good to think about because when you're doing an interview, you're gonna have to do that on the spot. Yeah. But is there anything else you want me to explain about this problem or how we got to the solution, why everything is translated as the way it is? Anything? No? Okay. So we can take a quick break now before we go into practice problems in the mock interviews. All right, so let's continue. And uh, we can continue with another uh, Benang programming example practice problem. So please uh, take a look at the problem statement. So essentially we are given uh, a 2D array in the form of triangle. And we are starting from the top vertex. And um, we're starting from the top vertex and trying to reach to the very bottom level uh, by only traveling to the adjacent nodes. So if we are at four, for example, we can only go to five or seven. As we reach the very last level, we want to uh, find the path that will be the cheapest in our case. So, well, for this example, we start at two, then we can go either to three or to four. Uh, from there, we can, for, if we go to three, then we can either go to six or to five. If we go to five, we can either go to one and to eight. And it turns out that among all paths, this path two, three, five, and one has the smallest path sum. So as we are trying to approach the, this problem, uh, let's try to think of, of what kind of sub problems we can solve here. So for now, we are trying to reach the very last level. So imagine we wanted uh, to compute what is the minimum path sum to reach to interim levels, or maybe even better, what is the minimum path sum to reach every single number before the last level. So imagine, so imagine you had uh, all numbers available for this last level. So you know that to reach number four, for example, the minimum, the path sum, the minimum path sum is like fifteen. To reach number one is eleven. To reach number eight is some other value. So what would you, what you would do is just traverse this array and find the minimum value. Well, 
to know these values, you essentially need to know what happens in the previous part of the chart. So here is the solution idea. We will use an auxiliary to DRA, we'll call it DP, and we'll record the minimum path, minimum path sum to reach every particular node in our triangle. This way, we will be able to find the minimal path sum to the, uh, to the last level in particular. So we can find the minimal path sum to traverse the entire tree, which the problem asks us to do. So imagine, um, I'll explain it in an example. Imagine we have this initial triangle, just like in the uh, problem statement. So two, three, four, six, five, seven, four, one, eight, three. So let's start from the very beginning. What is the minimum path sum to reach the first, very first node? It's just two, right? You don't need to go anywhere. You just start from two and you're already where you want to be. Well, knowing that, can you tell me what would be the minimum path sum to reach this node, for example, four? Correct. So you know that to reach this cell, you can either go from this cell or from this cell. Well, you know that there is nothing here. So the only way to reach cell number four is to go from cell number two. And you already know that to reach cell number two, the minimum path sum is two. So you simply add two and four and get six. Well, same thing works for three, since you know that the only way to get there is to jump from two. So two plus three equals five. So, and you see where it's going. We just repeat the same process again. So I'll do it once again. For this cell here, for seven, the only way to reach it is from cell four. We know that the minimum path sum to reach cell four is six. So the minimum path sum to reach cell seven is six plus seven, which is 13. Well, it gets a little trickier with cell five. As you can see, there are essentially two ways to reach it, from cell two and from cell four. Well, in this case, we'll choose the minimum, the minimum sum available. So the path sum can either be eight, three plus five, or nine, four plus five. Well, minimum of that is eight. So we store eight, and then to reach six, there is only one way to get there, it's nine. So as we reach the final level here and fill in the array completely, we are able to find the minimum path sum to reach every single element in the last level. And the problem asks us to simply find the minimum of those values. So simply by traversing the last, um, last level of the array, we can find that value. Okay, so with this in mind, let's try to do some coding. So, So I guess so well, imagine we are asked to write a function that receives a two-dimensional array in form of triangle nums, and we want to return the minimum path sum. Well, uh, we can start from recording the size of the array. because we'll use it a lot. Then, as I mentioned, we'll initialize a new auxiliary array, call it dp, its size n, and we'll initialize it to zero. So what this does is just uh, sets all values in the array to zero. And then we know that the very first value, 
our base case is simply dp0 equals nums 0. So it's uh, 0, 0, sorry. Simply the very first value is, is the exact value we already know. After that, um, I'm, I'm actually sorry, I want to have, since we have two dimensional array. Right. So the first value is the same as in nums array. And after that, we want to traverse every single row of that nums array line by line. So we start from the, sec um, from the second row. And we go all the way to the nth row. So here, uh, we want to traverse all values. And we have a choice. We want to. We can either traverse the values on each row from zero to n, or from n to zero. Well, the choice is arbitrary, so I can. Uh, in this case, I will choose uh, uh, to start from the last value, but that really is your is your choice. So and now. We essentially have three cases in each row. As we have noticed, if we are at the very beginning of the row, then there is just one way to reach that cell from the previous row. So if j equals zero, then we know that the minimum path sum to reach ij, well, it's simply the same as the minimum path sum to reach um, I minus I minus one j plus the value of nums at that point. Okay, so there is other special case uh, when we are at the very end of the of the specific row. Then there is also just one way to get there. So if j equals n minus one. Oh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Actually, I made a typo. I'm sorry. We have a triangle array. So we want to start not at n, but actually at i, since our every single subsequent row has the number of elements equal to the number of row we are at. So we start at i, and therefore the condition here is j equals y j equals i. So in this case, this is simply i minus 1 j plus nums i j. Right, and then the final case when uh, we're actually somewhere in the middle of the row, we can simply find the minimum of the two values that, pre that precede that row. So in this case, general case, it will be minimum of the value, the node on the left and node right above it plus nums at that position. So that's it for our traversal. And now we have our DP array ready. After that, we simply want to find the maximum value of that array in the last row. So we can have an auxiliary variable rest, for example. We start at the beginning and then We simply update the rest. So we simply find the minimum. And that's basically it. So just a few lines of code. And uh, let me know if you have any questions.
So there is one problem with this code, just like we had in Fibonacci numbers. There is a problem with space complexity. Here, as you can see, we're using a two dimensional array. But actually, how many values does the value depend on? So when we are at, imagine we are at row i and we want to compute that value. All we need to know is just two values above to the left and above to the right. In other words, we only need to know the values in preceding row to find the values in the next row. So what you might want to do is simply to have one auxiliary array, one dimensional auxiliary array, and that will sell you a lot of space. And that's what actually we'll do. So uh, I have one. Worksheets. So here, uh, let's take some time to and try to change this solution. How do I show that? Okay. Nice. So this is essentially the solution I just wrote. Uh, I can quickly go over it again. So we start by declaring the array. Then we traverse all its interim values by considering three distinct cases when we're at the edges of the row and then find the minimum value. So now let's try to change the algorithm slightly and so that we can reduce to simply an one dimensional array. So let's take some time to do that.
Okay. Since we're a little short on time, let's try to see what's going on here. So, um, essentially, what we're trying to do is use 1D array and update it every, every single step. So now you can actually see the reason why we start at the very end of the row and go all the way here. Since this array is basically stored in our memory in this way. So we are trying to go from this to a single, single array. So we start at the very top and then we record the value here in this spot. When we go to the second level, we want to update this same array, but with new values. However, there is some value here already. So we don't want to rewrite a new value while we still need it. So we start from the very end. We know this spot is free. So we record our new value, this value here. And then we update this value, this value here, based on what we already know. And same happens as we go down one, one step. We first record the very last element of the row. Then we update previous two. So here is actually the correct solution. So what we're doing here, first, we initialize the very top value in DPRA. So that would be the first value in our triangle. Then we want to store our new value in temp variable so that we accidentally do not change something we still need. We update that value so accordingly, since we know that DPRA stores values in the row just on the top of the row we are looking at now. So imagine we are looking at some arbitrary value here. So we know that temp value is something that, that's in nums array plus some combination. It could be just value right on the top of it or on the left. So the minimum value of those two plus that value. And then after that, we want to update this DP array so we can use it as we go to the next level, to the next step. Finally, as we reach the end of this cycle, of this loop, we get resulting values for the very last row. And then we can find the minimum of those. So do you have uh, any questions about how we reached here? OK, then we can briefly go over this next problem. Please take a look at the problem statement. So essentially, we are given a two-dimensional matrix we filled with either zeros or ones, and we are trying to find the largest square that contains only ones, only ones. So, well, for example, here, the largest square is two by two, either red or green one, and we return its area. So two times two is four. So again, just like in the previous problems and just like in any DP problems, we are trying to break our problem into sub-problems. So I know it's a little bit trickier here, but for example, imagine you have another matrix which stores the largest square up to some part of the initial matrix. So for example, what if you know that in this region, the largest square is size one, for example, then in this region, the largest square is size two and so on. Well, then you'll be able to, just by traversing the, that array, you'll be able to find the maximum value overall. So our solution idea is very close to that. So what we are trying to do is we have an 
a two-dimensional matrix where each element represents the side length of the maximum square whose bottom right corner is the cell with that index of the original matrix. So for example, for example, this value here corresponding to this value here. So we know that the largest square whose bottom left corner is this cell is three. So we store three in the corresponding cell of DP area. Or here, we know that the largest square with the bottom left value in this uh, bottom left corner in this cell is two by two. So we store two in the cell corresponding to that cell and so on. So uh, by knowing this, how can we find the correct maximum value? So imagine we have this DP array. What can we do to find that maximum value overall? So we know that the maximum value of all squares whose bottom left corner is a particular cell, it's known. So basically, this covers all possible configurations of squares. So in this array here, we know the maximum sizes of all squares, just within different subdivisions. So basically partitioned our set of uh, possible squares into these different cases by the bottom right corner. Well, we can simply traverse the array and find the, ma the maximum value. In this case, it's three, so we return three. So, uh, well, that's if we have the P array. Let's see how we would build that array. So to answer that question, we want to know how the value in ij coordinates with ij coordinates depends on previously recorded values. So, well, there is one simple case. Imagine we have zero in our matrix. Well, obviously, what would be the value to the in the corresponding cell of our DP array? What would be the largest square with all ones? Zero, right. So there is no ones in there. So the corresponding value would be zero. The case when the value in the cell is one is a little more trickier. So for example, you are looking at this cell here and you're trying to figure out what the value of DPRA is in that cell. So essentially you're trying to find squares of this, of this kind. So, well, intuitively, what would be the values you would be looking for? Well, essentially those are some adjacent values. Which adjacent values? Well, it's bottom right corner. So you probably want to look at value just to the left of it and just to the top of it. It turns out you need all three actually. So all three values, just to the left, just to the top and diagonally. So let's see how this works. Let's see what is the recurrence relation in this case. So for this example, since value, there is value three here, so we know that this square here only has ones. Then we also know that this square here only has ones. And since we have two here, we know that this square here only has ones. Well, just by looking at it, we know that the answer would be three, but we want to know it in general case. So we are trying to, what we are trying to find is the largest square. So let's look at its size. So on one hand, the maximum size, so the maximum size of the uh, bottom size, uh, bottom side of the square is the minimum of this and this. Well, why? Because imagine if your matrix is larger than this, so you also have something here, you know for sure that this value is zero, otherwise your values here would be larger. So 
you know for sure that the square cannot exceed what we already have. So the site, the size of the site on the bottom would be the minimum of this side and this side. So the minimum of these two values plus one, of course. Same argument works on the other side. So we would take the minimum of size of this square here and this square here and add one. So essentially what we are doing is we are taking the minimum of all three values. So at position i minus one, j minus one, i minus one, j and i j minus one. And add in one. So I know it might not be clear right away why this is the case, but uh, I suggest you just uh, take a look at more examples and try to play around with it and see that this formula actually works. So now, um, I guess, do we, do we have time to do worksheet or is it? Okay. So, well, in this case, I can just tell you um, the correct solution here and you can work with the worksheets on your own. So uh, what we do here is we first initialize our auxiliary array and then we want to update our result value, which would be the maximum value overall as we traverse our original matrix. So as you can see, there are actually special cases here as well. For example, it's pretty much clear what's going on in the first row and first column. Well, what could be the sizes of squares whose bottom right corners lay in these squares? What can the size be? Can it be like 10 or two? Right, it could be either zero or one. And zero in case if you already have zero in that cell, and one if we have one in that cell. So essentially, you want to check for these two cases, if there is zero in that cell or one and update your DP array accordingly. So this is what these two parts do. And after, uh, and after that, there is a general case when you are traversing this large part. Now, we want to utilize that recurrence relation. So essentially what you will be having here is that formula with minimum of three values before plus one. That's pretty much it for this case. Although you can still optimize the solution. Once again, the space complexity is n squared here. And it turns out we can also use just 1D array. Well, how? You can notice that we only need to know values, these three values, to find out the value here. That means that you can have an auxiliary array which stores all values of the row just above it, and then try to fill out a temporary array with these values and simply copy it over to your original array. So by the time you reach the end, you will have an array which stores all values at the bottom row. And at the simultaneously, you can also find the maximum value. I know since we are, we are short on time, I didn't have as much time to explain it in detail, but this is essentially the code you can uh, work with the worksheets um, at home. And yeah, I guess we can move on to mock interviews. So there are several problems here. Um, so first of all, it would be interested in doing
Well, if this is the case, we can just go over um, the problems. Are you sure? <laughs> okay, uh, we can go over the problems then. Maybe we start with time versus What? Maybe start with time versus